Hello and welcome to the Renaissance English History Podcast, a part of the Agora Podcast Network. I'm your host, Heather Tesco. I'm a storyteller who makes history accessible because I believe it's a pathway to understanding who we are, our place in the universe, and being more deeply in touch with our own humanity. This is episode Who the Heck Knows, I've lost track, and it's on pilgrimages in medieval England and then how that changed under the Reformation. But first, I would be remiss if I did not tell you about TudorCon, specifically the TudorCon streaming ticket. So I swore up and down, up and down. If you listen to my episode on word painting, (laughs) it all comes full circle. Up and down, up and down, she wandered. Um, I wonder if I'll keep this in or if I'll edit this out. Anyway, where was I? Oh, I swore up and down. And if you don't know what I'm talking about right now, I'm really sorry. You can just go back and like listen to the episode on word painting in in Elizabethan madrigals. I'm sure I did an episode on that. I must have. If not, I will. And there's the fair Phyllis I saw sitting all alone, feeding her flocks near to the mountainside. And she got lost and wandered up and down, up and down. Anyway, I swore up and down, up and down that I wasn't going to do another online ticket this year. Man, that got sidetracked really fast. Um, when I was doing TudorCon in person, because it's just like too much to manage, I thought. And then um, I realized, thanks to my husband telling me that it became too much to manage because I complicated the heck out of it before. So a lot of people requested it. People are still weirded out about travel. And, you know, rightly so for a lot of people. The economy is doing weird stuff. So, you know, making the decision to come to TudorCon for a lot of people just wasn't going to going to work out. So, I am offering the streaming ticket, the TudorCon streaming ticket. It is only $24, you guys. $24. What does your $24 get you? I'm glad you asked. It gets you streaming access to all of the talks, parties, and the entertainment, which will all be on Zoom. It's going to be the most fun you have on Zoom like ever, I think. The Zoom sessions will be recorded so you can go back and watch things afterwards. I'll be posting all of the links in a private group on the Tudor Learning Circle, which is my social network just for Tudor history nerds. Um, The talks will be archived there for at least six months after, if not longer, so you can continue to watch them at your leisure. You'll also get a digital goodie bag with digital welcome materials and gifts and prizes that are actually worth more than the ticket itself. Thank you to those who have donated ebooks and e art and things like that. You'll also get some very special entertainment for the Saturday evening. On Saturday evening, the people who are there in person will be going to the Renaissance Fair. However, you coming on the streaming ticket will get some very special entertainment of your own. So, englandcast.com slash tutorcon online englandcast.com slash tutorcon online it's $24 three days of tutor madness September 9th through 11th you know you want to come right so englandcast.com slash tutorcon online I will see you all there hopefully there we are boy that went that went sideways quickly I want to chat about tutor pilgrimages specifically how they changed during the Reformation. So one thing about me is I love travel. My happy place is sitting in a window seat on a plane going to some country I've never been to before. And actually, one of my proudest achievements in my life is that in 2020, I got a new passport. When I got my new passport, they sent me the thicker version that flight attendants get because I had used every page. I had a stamp on every page of that sucker. Um, Of course, the pandemic hit. So, you know, now I've (laughs) I've got an empty passport that's also the thicker one. So it's like really rubbing my nose in it. Um, But anyway, you know, I'm very happy that I achieved that goal of having had a stamp on every page of my passport. I I was very, very proud. Um, it, It might be right up there. And it's definitely one of the top five most proud moments, I think, of my life. Um, simply because of, you know, the adventures and the new people that it allowed me to meet and um, all the memories that go along with those stamps. So what would I, a person like me, have done in medieval England? And how did that change in Tudor England? Well, I suppose I would have become like Chaucer's wife of Bath, and I would have gone on pilgrimage. 
For a long time, I held the belief, like so many people do, that our pre-modern friends didn't travel. But this is incorrect. They had the wonders of the pilgrimage. So now look, I'm not going to tell you that every woman went on pilgrimages to Santiago de Compostela, or Rome, or Corinth, or Ephesus, or Jerusalem, like Chaucer's wife of Bath did. But the fact that she was even a somewhat believable character in the 14th century tells you that it wasn't unheard of for women to go on these pilgrimages, and indeed for anyone to go on these pilgrimages. Also, most monasteries wanted to acquire relics, like, for example, the breast milk of the Virgin Mary or a sliver of the True Cross. Not so much because of the devotional experience that it provided the monks, although, though, of course, that was one attraction, but also because it drew pilgrims. A pilgrimage was thought of in the Middle Ages as a journey that one would take away from their home when they were looking for spiritual well being. One of the earliest sites of pilgrimage in England was Holy Island in Lindisfarne in uh, Northumbria, where I actually made a pilgrimage myself back in 2016 with a very dear friend. Uh, An island three miles off the coast, there's a line of posts that mark the pilgrim's way, uh, which can be crossed twice a day when the tide goes out and the land appears out of the North Sea. These days you can drive across, which is what I did, lame. But in the Middle Ages, people were told that, you know, suffering on a journey to a holy place would help you to secure your spot in heaven. And the pilgrimage was an important part of everyone's lives. In Canterbury alone, before the Reformation, about 200,000 people a year were visiting, going on pilgrimage to see the shrine of Thomas Becket. And that was close to 10% of the entire population of England. England was a country that was mobile, thanks to these pilgrimages. People would go on trips for a number of different reasons. Some people would go just for the spiritual piety, others because of penance for their sins, for example. Then there was the healing. A lot of times people would go on pilgrimages to places that were meant to have healing properties or there were specific shrines that you would visit for specific reasons. I've mentioned before on this show, Henry VIII made a trip to the shrine in Walsingham, which is a special shrine to the Virgin Mary, where they do have, supposedly, the vial of her breast milk. And he went there after Catherine of Aragon gave birth to a son for Thanksgiving, You walk the final mile or so of the journey in bare feet, and Henry did that. Uh, It was, of course, too early because his son would later die. But, you know, this was a specific shrine to give thanks for childbirth and to look out for the protection of new mothers. So there were different shrines that had specific reasons that you would go to them. There were some shrines that were, you know, for healing different, different properties. So that would be another reason why people went. Um, Also, Some went, like I said, for penance, for forgiveness of sins. Maybe they were given part of their sentence was that they had to do a pilgrimage uh, to get forgiveness for some particular crime. Of course, there were others that, like me, they just wanted the chance to see new pastures. They wanted to have a little bit of an adventure. And these pilgrims, of course, pilgrimage was a way to get that travel in you aren't going to go to the Lord of the manor and say, hmm, hey, Lord, I want to check out what's, uh, what's on there on the other side of the river, over the water, over the hill, under the hill, over the water. Um, I would like to, to try that. No, no, no. You would say, hey there, Lord, I need to, uh, I need to make a pilgrimage. And it just so happens, of course, that it is over the hill and under the water and uh, to and fro, up and down. <laughs> And of course, your Lord would be much more likely to let you go on your pilgrimage. And so you could get a little bit of adventure that way as well. One other thing that's interesting is that every type of person went on pilgrimage, again, like the Canterbury Tales, the group, you know, you would have people from every social class, lords, knights to farmers was the one time where everybody would have the opportunity to meet up 
and, you know, really gather with other social classes. So the routes on the roads would be dangerous. They would all have to stick together, travel in groups. So you really would see these groups like the group that was put together in the Canterbury Tales of different classes, different types of people who were all working together and protecting each other on this pilgrimage. You could either go on a trip to a shrine in the next parish over, just a little day trip, or you could take a trip across the country, or even to another country. So, you know, every country had shrines. You could go to Jerusalem, you could go to wherever you had the finances and the time. You could go to Spain, you could go to Germany, you could go to France, you could just just shrine your way across across Europe um, and the Middle East. Within England itself, of course, there were shrines, not just Canterbury, there were shrines like at Walsingham. And another very popular one for our pre Tudor friends, even into the Tudor period, was at Lincoln. The Lincoln Cathedral actually for about 200 years was the tallest building on the planet. So people would go to be awed, to feel reverential, to worship, and to um, receive indulgences during the later medieval period as well. So um, that was another special place. But of course, then the Reformation came about. Um, There was this idea in the Reformation that God was not just in one particular place. God was everywhere. Why did you need to go to the cathedral at Lincoln to receive the sacrament? Why did you need to put extra special reverence? Why did you need to put extra special reverence on this one place when God was in your parish church as well? So there was this idea of the veneration of images of the cult of saints, indulgences, granting indulgences. One thing I think is interesting is in Rome, especially if you made a pilgrimage to Rome, you of course would receive lots of indulgences for sins, both past and future. And every hundred years, and then it became every 50 years for a while, um, the Pope would have a special Jubilee year. And you got double indulgences if you went to Rome that year. It started in 1300. And then they were going to do it just every hundred years. But then because of the decline in travel, thanks to the Black Death, the Pope said, oh, we'll do it again in 1350, get some travel up. And you know, so you get your extra indulgences for that two for one. It's a very, very good deal. Um, So, you know, things like that became prime targets for the Reformation. Martin Luther himself At first, he just started kind of questioning the value of pilgrimages. But by 1520, he said, all pilgrimages should be stopped. There is no good in them. No commandment enjoins them. No obedience attaches to them. Rather, do these pilgrimages give countless occasions to commit sin, to despise God's commandments. And to be fair, it was true that pilgrimages would give you ample opportunity to commit sin because, you know, what happens in Canterbury stays in Canterbury. You're people, strangers on the road with each other, two ships passing in the night. It's not necessarily a coincidence that Southwark is the place on the outskirts of London where people would, would start their pilgrimage to Canterbury. And that's also, of course, where a huge number of prostitutes were, the geese of Winchester, as they were known, because they actually paid their tithes, their their money, their taxes to the Bishop of Winchester. Um, but, you know, it was, it was no accident that these sorts of places were on the roads where the pilgrims were. And there was certainly the temptation, especially if you knew that you were going to get an indulgence on the way, because, you know, just saying, just saying. So, you know, Martin Luther was kind of pointing that out. And also, to be fair, the Lollards had talked about this too. So it's not new to Luther. He also was not down with the idea of going on pilgrimage to earn salvation through good deeds, because of course, salvation comes through God's love, not good good deeds, faith alone, right? So then in England, we see especially 
the dissolution of the monasteries. This was a blow to people, to the local economies who relied on the influx of money from the pilgrims, and also for people who believed in the pilgrimage's power to heal. Or they, again, were like me, and they just wanted to get out of Dodge for a little bit, right? So you can imagine if if your only way of getting out and having a little bit of a holiday was through pilgrimage, and now you're being told that you can't do that, that wouldn't necessarily go down well. Also, for example, the economies, the local towns would sell these sorts of badges, these souvenirs that they would press them against the relics, for example, against the bones or or whatever the particular relic was. And then it was thought to infuse that badge or that souvenir with part of the magic, part of the healing, part of the power of that saint. And then people could pin that on their cloak and, and have it and be like, hey, look, I've just been at Canterbury. And also you could show it to your boss, to your lord, um, to your overseer when you got home. Yeah, you know, I said I wanted time off to make that trip to Canterbury. Well, I did it. Here's my badge to prove it. So that was a way that towns would make money. And people really enjoyed having these sorts of talismans, these sorts of these sorts of souvenirs that they would collect. And the local economies really liked selling them. So again, um, you know, it was something that that Henry and the disillusion took away from people. Before too long, the majority of English shrines had been destroyed. And the monasteries, which had, of course, been providing hospitality to pilgrims, places to stay, food, drink, they had also been dissolved. So there wasn't really any place to stop and, and plan your trip that way. And while some people still saw the value in pilgrimages, it was really starting to go away as something that was a recognized thing. You know, if 10% of the population is going to Canterbury every year, it was not at that level by the end of the 16th century. But what's interesting is that the idea of pilgrimage is still, was still, is still a very powerful idea that that we still have. You know, you can think about people today going to memorials, for example. Um, I was just at a library conference in DC and my husband and daughter came along. And of course, we've just moved back from Spain. And um, my daughter had never been to to DC before. And, you know, they went around and did all of the different memorials and, and seeing all of the different things. That's a form of pilgrimage, right? For a lot of sports fans, the first time my husband and I went to, we went to old Yankee Stadium and new Yankee Stadium. That was a form of pilgrimage. And, you know, the same kind of thing. He had to buy the hat, you know, from the old stadium and the new stadium. I used to live in Los Angeles, you know, and people would make pilgrimages to like Hollywood Boulevard, to the stars in the in the street and that kind of thing. So the idea of a pilgrimage, I think, is something that's still very powerful and palpable within us. But doing it solely for piety, for the sale of indulgences, um, for specifically religious reasons is something that we don't do anymore. And yet the idea of it never really went away. There were still books, for example, in the 17th century, then we have Bunyan's The Pilgrim's Progress. This is undoubtedly a Puritan book. This is not Catholic at all. And yet, you know, there's this person who leaves their home, their family, in order to seek the celestial city. The one thing that it started to develop into then was this this element of curiosity, just to see the marvels of the world. The centuries after the Reformation, and we start to see the rise in humanism and, and science and all of this kind of stuff happening at the same time and causing one another, right? But the world became so much more interesting. Suddenly, there was so much more to see in the world. You didn't necessarily need this excuse of pilgrimage of God. It was just it was enough to want to see the beauty of the world. It was enough to want to see a different place in the world. It was enough to want to see beautiful buildings or, or beautiful scenery, or just to experience a place where a certain kind of history happened. That became enough of a reason. And then by the 18th century, England starts to see the idea of the grand tour of young people going on this grand tour. Um, and, and that becomes a 
a really powerful idea for people as well. One 17th century traveler, Henry Timberlake, went to Palestine even and and wrote an account of his journey. And he talked about how moved he was by his experiences. He fell to his knees at the first sight of Jerusalem. This is a 17th century Protestant writing this. So some of his contemporaries did scorn the idea of going on these types of pilgrimages. But, you know, they still would visit the great churches if given the opportunity. And I just think it's an interesting concept, this this change that we start to see from travel because of God to or war. God or war would be the main reasons people traveled to the idea that it just becomes enough to travel for the joy of experiencing something new and meeting new people and seeing new things. And, you know, it's easy to imagine the people in the pre-modern period as being these provincial people, never going anywhere, seeing anything, or, you know, like a Monty Python sketch. There's some lovely filth over here, Dennis. <laughs> you know, and surely, yes, it, you know, just this simple act of getting around from place to place to place was much harder and, and took a lot more work than it does for us. Within a few hundred years, if we're all living on Mars or have figured out ways to tesser between planets, like in A Wrinkle in Time, people might very well look back at us and think about how provincial we are all staying in our same country. So, you know, I think if we all give everybody some grace and realize that we're all just humans, we always have been humans, we're all just doing our thing, doing the best we can with the tools we have available to us. Um, People in the Middle Ages and then the Tudor period live their lives as we live ours. And I think pilgrimage is a really neat lens through which to look at history and a really neat lens through which to look at these changes and think about not just the idea and the history behind the pilgrim experience, but also what the Reformation meant, taking away that opportunity for people to travel and also eventually giving them a new reason to travel, which is just because it's a joy to do it. And uh, all the cool people you meet, all the cool memories you make. So that's it. Ending that opportunity for pilgrimages is just, you know, part of the massive upheaval that would have trickled down to ordinary people during the Reformation. And, you know, another way that people would have had to sort of think about remaking their lives during that period. So that is my story for the week. That is it. With that in mind, my friends, TudorCon, TudorCon online streaming ticket. Grab it now. Englandcast.com slash online. Tu- no, wait, what is it? TudorCon online. Englandcast.com slash TudorCon online. Or just go to Englandcast.com. There's a big pop up. You'll see it. You can figure it out. Um, I hope to see you there. It's going to be a lot of fun. We've got some amazing talks. Um, on everything from Tudor food, Tudor dress, Tudor all, you know, it's just all Tudors all the time. Check it out. There's a list of speakers and entertainment, all kinds of fun. New friendships. Speaking of new friendships and new things, we have this group. There's going to be a whole lot of other people watching the streaming ticket. You might meet your new best friend in that group. I don't know. I'm just saying you might. Yeah. And it's $24. I tried to keep the price really reasonable. Um, I want to make it available for people, as many people as possible. I can't give it away because like I have expenses to do it, but I want to keep it as reasonable as possible to let the most people come and enjoy and participate and have a good time. So I hope that I will see you then englandcast.com slash tutorcon online. And I think that's it. Thanks for listening to me ramble. I will be back again, rambling and philosophizing and thinking about the Tudor period (laughs) in another couple of weeks. And I will throw in a Monty Python reference because I don't think I can let an episode go by in which I don't throw in a Monty Python reference. All right, my friends, be safe, be well. I will talk with you again soon. Bye. Blow northern wind, a scent for baby sweating. Blow northern wind, blow, blow, blow. Ich hoort a bird in bower breek, that soul is semi is on seek. Men school maiden of meek, fair and freight of bond. In all